Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And this is the uh, third episode of a series we're doing uh, called um, uh, Cults. And we're t discussing Mormonism first. Uh, the third uh, episode on Mormonism, we're comparing Mormon doctrine to what the, the Holy Scriptures say. So uh, we're going to just pick up where we left off last time. But if you did not see the first two episodes, uh, they're available on my channel, you, uh, Sin City Preacher. They're, each episode is two hours long, so they're very uh, uh, thorough. Uh, I hope you go back and watch those. But let's start off first by introducing the panelists. Uh, uh, why don't we start with Sister Tanya? Is Tanya still there? Okay. Let's start with uh, Brother Austin. Hey guys, it's uh, my name is Austin Bell. My channel is Austin Bell. I'm glad I could be back this time. Uh, God willing, he gave me a job. I've been praying on a long time, and I'm doing an oil job with my uh, my uncle. Uh, just uh, something to do right now to figure out what I'm planning to do with my future. But uh, I'm glad I could make it this time, and uh, let's uh, let's get this exposure done. Amen. Okay, um, hang on one second. I uh, neglected one thing that's important here. Give me just a second here. That was uh, Brother Austin. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to forget the uh, sp sound effects. They're a lot of fun. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Brother Luke. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Austin. And uh, next we have his bro Brother Eric. Hi. Uh, my uh, channel on YouTube is Jesus Knight 72 uh, Happy to be here with everybody. Uh, let's get the word out. Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and now we have Brother Jackson. I think Jackson's having problems with his mic. <laughs> oh, okay, let's move on to Brother uh, Ronnie. Ronnie, unmute, mute your mic, unmute it so you can talk. Uh, hi, my name is Ronnie, or uh, Hood Minister I go by on YouTube. Uh, only got one video. <laughs> I like it. Um, I guess the only reason I'm really on YouTube is to try and encourage people when I can. Uh, I do get adamant against uh, people coming against the gospel of grace because I believe it's the only gospel that uh, frees people up, and um, and it really is the, the, the gospel that Paul preached. Uh, it's the only gospel that frees. It's the only gospel that uh, uh, you can have an encouragement or, True, true assurance. You know, everything else you got to try and earn it or this way, that way. That's not what Jesus wanted. Uh, Jesus wanted to us to just trust in Him and what He did alone. We could never do it on our own. God bless. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, are Tanya, are you there? Is Tanya back? I am. I just got back. Sorry about that. Okay. Just say hi to everybody, and then we're about ready to start. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. Okay. Uh, it, it, let's try to, uh, uh, when you're not talking, mute your mics, because otherwise it's very chaotic with all the feedback. So everybody, please mute, mute your mics now, and then... Uh, I'm going to just basically introduce each of these Mormon doctrines and then ask each one to respond to it. Um, by the way, uh, for those of you who are just uh, watching uh, this for the first time, uh, what we're doing is uh, drawing from the Mormon's main uh, books, which is uh, the, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, uh, Doctrine and Covenants, and there another writing called Journals and Discourse. Uh, so these are from their own official writings what their belief system is and then uh, some of these doctrines they have are very very surprising most people are not aware of any of this and then we're going to look at scriptures to see if these uh, doctrines of Mormonism are bi biblical or not okay so let's talk, uh, go to this one first the current teaching of the Mormon Church all baptized members of the church in good standing eight years old and older must partake 
water is used instead of wine. Um, the Lord's Supper is a testimony of our faithfulness and our determination to keep God's commandments and means whereby we receive a continuing endowment of Holy Spirit. Articles of Faith, page uh, 175. So, um, what, uh, what's your take on that? That's talking about uh, their view on, on uh, Holy Communion. I'm not going to call on people. I'm just anybody who wants to speak. Go ahead. Well, by the by the com uh, go ahead, Austin. Oh, sorry, I didn't even see that uh, you're on my screen. It still says you're muted. I uh, sorry. I uh, I was just going to ask: Do they believe it's a, a necessary sacrament for salvation? Uh, they well, it says that they uh, um. In or, hmm. It says they must partake, all baptized members of the church in good standing, eight years old and older, must partake, and then water is used instead of wine. So it is kind of like the Catholics, how they teach that you need to have the communion in like a lordship kind of salvation where if you stop taking Holy Communion, your standings with the Almighty kind of goes down in a sense. Well, it's part of their work system. There's all kinds of things that they require their members to do. This is right, one of right. the works. It says they must do this uh, uh, communion, and it says uh, it, it's a testimony of our faithfulness and our determination to keep God's commandments, a means whereby we receive a continuing endowment of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems to infer through that that it maintains their connection with the Holy Spirit by keeping this going. So if they stop, it would seem to me that the natural progression of that would be that you wouldn't have a connection with the Holy Spirit. Like You have to keep doing this to maintain it. Yeah. Uh, well, let me read a couple of key words here, too, that I'm going to ask to emph – let's emphasize these points. It says, all, all baptized members – of the church in good standing. Okay, so how does that apply to uh, biblical Christianity as far as taking communion? Well, we do. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to. I don't see how that would call Christianity. Uh, okay, let's go to first uh, first Corinthians ten sixteen and seventeen. Someone, whoever finds these verses first, just start reading them. Okay. Hey, brother Luke, do uh, the Mormons have a confession? No, they don't. They don't have like confessional, like they confess to a priest. No. Okay. Do they believe that you need to uh, be sinless before you take uh, communion too, like the Catholics, or no? Uh, that, that's not really spelled out anything that I've seen. So, okay. but they they need you need to be a member of the Mormon Church in good standing. Okay, I understand. So, uh, did anybody find First Corinthians ten sixteen and seventeen? Ron, I'm Mike, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? We being many are one bread and one body. We are all partakers of that one bread. And I believe that the uh, only people who should be able to take this is those who are believers in Christ uh, and what he did. Uh, for our salvation, because we are the church, you know, we're the spiritual bricks that make up that bo that uh, church building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the word I'm looking for in your, that verse is the word all. So read that again, Ronnie, and and emphasize the word all. The cup of thing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread we break, is it 
not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Amen. Okay. So here you can see that the scripture tells us that we're all supposed to be partaking of communion. Now, uh, and then, whereas the doctrine of Mormonism says, no, it's limited to baptized members who are in good standing. Okay? So there's a clear difference between they way, what the, they see this baptism, um, this uh, communion, and the way the scriptures speak of it. Before I go on another verse, does anybody have anything else to say about that verse? Yeah, the, the, one, the big problem I see with that is how do you determine who is quote-unquote in good standing? What's that based on? Well, in Mormonism, they do have criteria. And, and uh, for example, you have, you have to have this regular attendance. You have to be paying your tithes, and you have to done go on your Mormon mission when you're at right age, and so on. They have all of the list of requirements, and if you fail in those points, you're not in good standing, and therefore you, you're not eligible for the communion. Right, and I see all, um, uh, Jackson is marking down here that a bishop apparently decides this, um, but I'm wondering if, you know, how they ga what do they gauge this by? I mean, if you're keeping this yourself and you're doing these things yourself, I mean, how do they monitor what you're doing? How, how, do, how does somebody keep track of these deeds in order to keep you in good standing? Um, well, the, uh, obviously, one of, the, one of the requirements, of course, for a male Mormon uh, and when they get to be out of high school, uh, they're supposed to go on this two-year mission. So that that's one, and there, there's other list of requirements they have, but uh, there's one that is obvious that you could say they did it or they didn't do it. And if someone yeah. didn't do it, then they wouldn't be in good standing. Okay, uh, let's go to Acts 2, 41 and 42. Whoever finds it first, just start reading it. What was that chapter and verse again, Luke? Two, chapter 2, verse 41. Verse 41, 42. okay. That's, that's what I thought you said. Okay. okay, 41 and 42. It says, uh -huh. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Okay. Um, so the, what do you derive from that verse regarding the, the, uh, um, the practice of communion? They were simply believers. They, they accepted Christ and were, became believers and so were worthy enough to share in the, uh, in, in the communion. Okay. Huh. Tanya just gave me a new thing here, so it threw me off my concentration off here. I was I'd see edited. Sorry, some... I accidentally clicked it. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So you're you're saying that they're believers, but what I'm looking at is that they're they're to do it. Believers were to do this. Is it was a regular thing for all believers. Uh, let's look at first First uh, Corinthians eleven twenty six. Tanya? All right, I just pulled it up. Um, it says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That okay. was the NIV. Yes, okay. So uh, what do we learn from this verse in terms of the practice of this communion? Well, it's a reminder of the blessing of uh, what Lord Jesus Christ did for us by the shedding of his blood, uh, uh, the breaking of his body, and that uh, uh, we can also tell people, that, you know, that he's coming back. Yeah. I'm a believer in a rapture, so this is a big one for me. 
when it comes to the rapture, taking the uh, communion? Well, the, the point is on that, uh, on that particular verse, um, Ronnie, you've got to mute, mute that one. Sorry, I'm terrible at this. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that particular verse, the point is that we are supposed to practice this communion uh, until he, Jesus returns. Okay? So what, what can we say from these, basic, these verses that we've gone through so far uh, regarding the practice of communion? Um, it seems to me it's just like a, a public display of your faith, pretty much. Okay, uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.16, we learned that uh, all believers are supposed to partake of it. It has nothing to do with your, your membership or your standing or uh, uh, any, anything else. Any believer is supposed to take it. Uh, and then in Acts 2.41, uh, we're supposed to be doing it on a regular basis. And then uh, in 1 Corinthians 11.26, it says we're supposed to continue doing it until Jesus returns. Uh, now, um, let's go to, uh, let's, let me read this part here. It says, uh, quote, quote, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you. Uh, so we're supposed to do this, uh, how would you describe this practice? Uh, Brother Luke, I got a question. Does this only consist with uh, communion? Does it have to be uh, wine and bread? Is it a special type of wine or a special type of bread? Well, the, the scriptures don't tell us uh, uh, anything more than bread and wine. Uh, and then, uh, but a lot of people think that the wine is unfermented, which is just grape juice. Uh, and then other people, I, I, first of all, I, I don't think that the Lord is a legalist and going to require that you have, use wine. If you don't have wine, you can use anything. Uh, I'll tell you how I see uh, communion. Uh, communion is similar to the, the concept of saying grace. If a person, eat, every time a person eats, whether it's bread and wine or whether it's a combination of food and drink, anything, you can do the same thing as you would in communion, which is remember the Lord and thank Him. So I just don't think that the Lord is, is dogmatic and legalistic about the exact uh, procedure that we have to do it, do it in. The, the key is to do it in remembrance of Him. Every time we break bread, which is breaking bread is just another way of saying eating, isn't it? Yes. Right. Yeah. That's that's a, that's something I've always agreed with exactly is when you at the moment when you're saying grace it allows you that time because you eat on a regular basis it's that time where you rem you 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 remember that it is not food that sustains you it is the Lord that sustains you and you remember that whenever you eat and drink because it is such a regular thing for you it 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 brings you into Thanksgiving it brings you into um, it just gives you that moment to pause so that you can remember what really sustains you is Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, even... It makes me think of uh, <clears throat> just for his blood for us, remembering what he did for us that way, but washing away our sins, and lost the payment God demanded, you know, for our sin, the payment of sin is death, I think, you know, in his resurrection later on. The Lord reminded us to remember those things, and I think we need to be thankful for that. Okay. Well, Ronnie, let me ask you, because it seemed like Eric immediately agreed with me. I, I don't know if anybody else thinks that this is uh, too, uh, maybe I'm being too informal about it, but uh, I, I think that uh, the idea of uh, eating a piece of bread, and like if you go to a church normally, they give you a little piece of cracker and, and a small little one of those tiny little thumbnail glasses with a, just enough for a, a little swallow of wine or grape juice. And that's how you do it. That's the customary way to do it. But to me, the, the importance of it is to remember his, his death for our sins. And uh, that Last Supper was saying, look, 
I'm, my body and my blood is being sacrificed for you. So when you eat, remember what I've done for you. So I think every time we say grace, every time we have a meal, anytime we break bread, whether we have a cracker and wine or anything we're eating, we can take that time to say grace and be thankful for Jesus, what he's done for us. Mm -hmm. Am I, I coming in? Yeah, we're yeah. getting you now, Jason. Okay, you okay now. it wants to eventually fix my mic. Great. Okay. Boy, you, you missed the most important parts. <laughs> No, I've been just, listening to this whole thing. Oh, okay. All right. So now you can get yeah. now you can give us your your commentary on everything. What do yeah. you think? To answer, um, I just wanted to quickly answer Austin's question about the standing. Um, knowing someone who is a devout Mormon for years, basically they have a little list of tests, and to be in good standing means you have what's called a temple recommend, which is like this ID card with your picture that says the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints on it. And being an officially good standing is to have a temple recommend. And the bishop goes through, and the, the, the well, list of questions is on the Internet. It's like ten questions, if I remember correctly. Some of them are objective, like do you drink coffee at all? Because if you do, you're not in good standing. But other ones, like are you trying your best to keep the commandments and things like that, it's up to the bishop's discretion pretty much. And like if you go to BYU, even if you're a non-Mormon there, you have to go through a similar process and get recommended by a bishop and everything. All this to basically say that the bishop has quite a bit of authority and has quite a bit of subjective leeway, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is the bishop... Thank you for giving us more clarity on that, uh, Jackson. Go ahead, Austin. Is the bishop technically their form of a priest? Yes and no. I mean, he's similar to a priest in the sense that he, in the sense that you like Luke said they don't go to confession to him. They they basically again there's more subjectivity with they do go and confess their serious sins, not weekly like a devout Catholic, but to a to a a bishop. So there there we go again with the subjective, but I think it's a bit different in that every Mormon in good standing has one of has at least the ironic priesthood, or at least every male member has at least the ironic priesthood, because they believe in the ironic and the Melchizedek priesthood, and the bishops have the Melchizedek priesthood, which is the the superior kind. So it's kind of like rather than we have a category of priest and non-priest, we have inferior priest and superior priest. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Guys, can't hear you, Ronnie. Your mic is muted, Ronnie. So, <clears throat> sorry. You guys, it's please good. forgive me. Bro, I, I mean, I'm in some god awful pain. No problem. All okay. right, brother. We'll just uh, participate to whatever degree you can. If you if you have to leave us, I can. All right, brother. If you if you have to go, that's right. That's all right. Okay, I'm sorry. I uh, I love you guys. You guys are great, but this is God bless, Ronnie. God bless, okay, Ronnie. brother. Yeah. Bye. You take care, buddy. Bless you, brother. All right. I hope everybody will keep Ronnie in in your prayers. Mm-hmm. Sure. All right. Uh, is that uh, is that the hood minister? Yeah. Yes. Oh wow! I I never met him before. Or I never knew it was him. Yeah, I think that uh, Ronnie and Ron, who is Duck4212, they're probably the very best I know on YouTube who actually uh, post really good written comments. Uh, it, every time they make a comment, you should read it. <laughs> it's very, very beneficial if you read all their comments they make on any videos. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to another Mormon doctrine. It says, uh, uh, this is from Mormon doctrine from... Uh, on page 1888, uh, Charles W. Penrose, quote, the, the living are thus authorized under prescribed conditions to act for the dead, and the fathers in the spirit world look to the children in the flesh to perform for them the works which they were unable to attend to while in the body. Knowledge that is needful concerning the spiritual sphere will come through an appointed channel and in the appointed place. The temple where the ordinances can be administered for the dead is the place to hear from the dead. 
Oh, you know what? This reminds me of like like um, a necromancer or something. Well, well, it's also it's also the same thing exactly as again. You get back to the Catholic thing, the alms for the dead, it, it, or or people who will pray you out of purgatory so that you don't have to so you serve too much time. They take you know when your behalf they make intercession for you and and kind of get you out of there because you didn't do it yourself. So it, it, again, it's it's it, they they. It's proof that they they take old ideas and they simply just twist them in another way. Yeah, it, it's true. And there's there's also a lot of uh, the Joseph Smith was a Mason, and he a lot of the ritual and stuff and, and symbolism is is from Masonry. That's what it's I funny. was going to ask. You know, it's funny you made that point. It's funny you both made that point, Austin. I, I had a feeling you might say something about that too because I noticed that in my study of this too. He does. There are ties to Masonry. Yeah, especially with the temple ceremonies in particular, those are very, they're they're very much a modified version of the Freemasonry. And by the way, what I said last hang out, and I'll say it again, someone I guess snuck a camera into the temple endowment ceremony, which no one is supposed to talk to, and we may even get hateful comments because I'm bringing this up. But if you're ever curious what one of those looks like, looks like, you can go on YouTube and see it and everything. And I read a complete script; it's word for word the same each time. So. Yeah, I, I noticed, uh, Jackson, on your channel, uh, I don't think it's one of your op uploads, but I saw a, a video that I didn't watch it yet. I've saved it. I'm going to watch it later. Uh, but it's it's about the uh, the uh, uh, secret ceremonies inside. Yeah, I liked that. I liked the video. Okay. I so what I did was, yeah, if you can go to his channel and look at that one that he liked and you can watch it. But I think it's an hour or two hours long. Yeah. So probably and, very and, thorough. So you and the, 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 this movie that they go in there and watch, because that's one of the parts of it, is they watch this movie that's kind of a reenactment of how they think creation's going. And I tried to watch it, but it kind of put me to tears because it was just the same thing over and over and over again. And it was like, ugh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Austin, Austin, what were you originally going to say about the Freemasonry thing? I didn't mean to cut you off there, brother. Sorry about that. It's all fine. It's all fine. I was just going to ask that uh, there's reason to make me believe. Is there another type of uh, Mormonism? Is there two different types? Well, you know, it's funny that you mention that because I've noticed a kind of trend, as with all religious beliefs, there's there seem to be some factions that are kind of branching off and saying, oh, well, we don't believe that. So now you've got an original set that you got from Joseph Smith, and I think it's great what Luke's doing here because the best thing he could possibly do is have the foundation that he's got here, which is you're taking this all from their writings. This is from the original writers. This was their ideas. So you, you can look right. all this stuff up. You can look it all up. It's right out there in the open where you can look these things up and find it. So people can't sit there and refute that. They'll try to, and these other factions that have now branched off are starting to say things like, well, we don't follow that. We, we, that's a misunderstanding. So you're beginning to have these different factions that are branching off and saying, we don't quite believe that, and we don't quite believe this. Well, if you don't, you're not a Mormon. You're, you're, you're something else. It's like, right, this, exactly. is the, this is the foundation of their belief. That's the yeah, well, that makes thing, me to believe that, uh, that also the, you know, the Book of Mormon is just like the, basically like the Quran. It's basically like Muhammad, you know, uh, Joseph Smith heard all these teachings, wrote in a book, and basically it overrides the Bible. It's just complete heresy. Mm -hmm. But uh, the reason I brought that up is because I, I did see a documentary on that, uh, on a special Mormon baptism, and it's where they, uh, I don't know, if, I don't think it's for every follower, but uh, I think they said it was 90% are the church, and then 10% are like the the bishops, like what Jackson said, and then the, the hierarchy. And they baptize those, the 10% in the Masonic uh, Mormon temples, and there's basically like these huge baptismal chambers, and they, they dunk them in a, in a weird ceremony, and it's almost, I think they have candles in there, it's almost like a ritual kind of sacrifice look to it, but it was very, very strange to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the inter Eric made a very good point, too, when he responded this there about how they're all splitting off, saying... Like, well, we don't think that. We think this. So that's a misunderstanding there. Because one of the things people don't realize about the Latter-day Saint movement, as it's officially called, is while the Mormon church, what we're talking about right now, is by far the biggest uh, church in this movement, it's not by any means the only one. And the, the, the second biggest was called Community of Christ. It used to be called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
and they 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 went with Joseph Smith the third rather than Brigham Young, and then there were people who went with Brigham Young who was for the FLDS. So really, you have if you just count the number of churches, granted most of them are very small, but you have a lot of different churches within this movement. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. One. I think one of the earlier divisions was uh, over the practice of polygamy. It's some of the smaller sects uh -huh. that are. Uh, uh, following the original teachings, uh, they they are like real isolated communities uh, that are like almost like survivalist camps where they uh, and they're all it's all polygamy. Uh huh. Well, the real sad thing is that uh, I'm not sure if most people know. I'm not judging him, but uh, just what they base their beliefs on. Uh, the man was uh, very sadistic in nature. He was a he was a Mormon leader in Utah, and he led a traditional Mormon. Uh, church, it, the the dress and the traditional housing, and I'm not sure if they had TV or anything, but uh, he had uh, multiple relations with children, and I never found out that, uh, I know he's still alive, he's in prison if you go look it up, uh, he ran uh, one out of Utah and one out of Texas was his church order, but uh, Joseph Smith was one of the earliest of the Mormon church to, uh, he blackmailed a family basically with uh, basically salvation like with the Catholic Church if you pay us this I'll get you into heaven Joseph Smith said if you give me your daughter you can get into heaven and I believe she was about nine or eight years old it was a really tragic thing but uh, that's why the Mormon Church traditionally believes and uh, same thing like with uh, with uh, traditional sects of Islam with uh, I, I'm not sure what you call it with pre- at adolescence to uh, 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 adults in in marriage or whatever that's called, but uh, that's they they both similar very similar in that teaching. Well, I know that we could uh, uh, discuss the uh, the character uh, and, um, of of the founders of this religion, and also in Islam and other religions, and uh, that that would be a way of exposing. I'm obviously to to if the founder is corrupt, then it would should certainly give you a good reason to question everything. Right. Um, but what we're trying to do is just expose their doctrines, because the, the public in general uh, isn't even aware of all these strange doctrines. So we want, we want the public to know about these doctrines, and then we want to examine: is that what the Bible says or not? So right. let's look at a couple of let's look at a couple of Bible verses and see what the Bible teaches about divination. Okay. Um, and the, the occult practices. Let me read this again one more time so you can see what they say. They say, the living are thus authorized under prescribed conditions to act for the dead, and the fathers in the spirit world look to the children in the flesh to perform for them the works which they were unable to attend to while in the body. Knowledge that is needful concerning the spiritual sphere will come through an appointed channel and in the appointed place the temple where the ordinances can be administered for the dead is the place to hear from the dead. Now, there's a few key words I emphasized, like the spirit world and channeling. <laughs> you know, these things are right out of like New Age religions and uh, uh, like right. Shirley MacLaine's books. Right, and we're back to square one we talked about in the last couple of videos. We, we go back to this New Age thing. <laughs> Nothing new about this age. Nothing new about it. Okay, let's see who can find this first. Um, uh, Ezekiel 13, 6, and 7. Better hurry before the crickets come. <laughs> I, I'm trying not to do the crickets because I don't want to stress you. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there they went. <laughs> I had... Now, see, I didn't have the Ezekiel reference, but I did have another reference that I had already looked up while you were talking when you mentioned the divination. Um, okay. So if you don't mind, there's another one that I was that mentioning. I can't think is going to kind of follow that. Yeah. It's back. It's in Deuteronomy 18:10, uh, and it says, "There shall not be found." They were talking about in Israel. Uh, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. He's talking about that they would give their children to Molech, uh, pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. So this is strictly, you know, even in just talking about the nation of Israel and the laws that they were under, divination was strictly forbidden. There, you are not to get involved in that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I have. Uh... 
that that's that's number three on my list, so I'll skip that when I get to it. So, but so there's one that clearly says divination is forbidden. I I have it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Ezekiel 13, 6, and 7, and then it also left me with another reference, Jeremiah 29, 8. Uh, Ezekiel 13, 6. <clears throat> they that have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord have not sent them, and they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vain vision, and hath ye spoke, have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. And then in Jeremiah 29, 8, it says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners, and that be in the midst of you, deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. Okay. And let's look at Acts 16, 16. Okay, I got that. It says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, this divination is not like some, uh, it, it, it's, it's an old thing that's been, you can see all through the Old Testament. Uh, and and in the, even in the early church age, there you can see people that were doing these things. Uh, so, it but we're going to see over and over again how yeah, this is condemned. Uh, it was. Let's go to Leviticus 26 and, tw and 27. Leviticus 20, verse 6 and 27. Twenty verse. What did you say? Uh, chapter 20, verse 6. And okay, I got it. I got it. And verse 27. All right, all right. So Leviticus 26 says, and the no, soul. No, 20, 20, verse 6. Chapter 20, verse 6. Oh, okay, yeah. So that's what I meant. That's where I am. Sorry. Okay. Said it confusingly. <laughs> okay. Here's Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go to a. To go to a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and I will cut him off from among his people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we're not going to find anything in the in the scripture as we go through these verses that is condoning talking to the dead <laughs> and and uh, using this as a, as a practice as the Mormons uh, describe it in their doctrine here. Uh, and as we go through these, just uh, if I, before I go on the next one, if someone has something to add, just stop me, okay? I think uh, Tanya had a good uh, point real fast on divination. I just looked into it. It's uh, if Tanya wanted to tell everybody what that was. Oh, go ahead, Austin. I got my daughter here. I'm trying to put her to bed. I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> no problem. I'll read what she said. Uh, <clears throat> divination, I guess, is. Uh, trying to prove God by signs and symbols. Uh, she says, divination means this according to the Strong's. In Greek mythology, the name of the Pythian serpent or dragon that dwelt in the region of Pythro at the foot of Paranassus in Phocis was said to have guarded the oracle at Delphi and been slain by Apollo. So I guess it's a uh, type of serpent spirit that uh, they, they use to show divination. Okay. Now, uh, I think Tony, or someone found uh, 20, verse 6. Could you give us 20, verse 27 also in Leviticus? It says, all right, verse 27 says, A man or woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death and they shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. Wow. All right. Yeah. So here we have the most severe punishment uh, in Judaism. Uh, that's someone who does this practice. Right. And this is exactly what uh, what Jackson called it. It is necromancy. What it is is, um, and people, it has become actually, it's it's become a huge rave these days now, which is a summoning familiar spirits again, seances, things of that nature, trying to commune with the dead. Um 
it's become very popular again. There, there are all kinds of television shows about it. They, I mean, back in the day, you'd be hard pressed to find a lot of these things, but it's very, very popular. Um, sure. That's what it is. It's allowing another spirit, which we know aren't people at all, or spirits of people at all, to to actually enter a person and allow them to do things through you or speak through you. I, now, I think sorry, that we, we uh, if a, you were to uh, begin a study now and just do a search on uh, uh, spiritualism and New Age religion and spiritualism, uh, the, the words that they use is spirit realm and channel. Mm -hmm. And we have these two terms right in their doctrine, in their printed doctrine. Mm -hmm. So here you can see that the, the Mormon uh, founders were studying all this spiritualism and using it as, as bringing it into Mormonism. Let's look at Isaiah uh, 47, 13. What I was going to say was... Uh from the Old Testament, it was it was mediums, wizards, sorcerers, fortune tellers, uh, witch doctors, witchcraft. Uh, is all that the same? All pretty much the same, same guideline. Yeah, yeah, I they pretty much yes, they're all part of the same thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that like you have an umbrella, they would all fall under that one um, that umbrella. Okay. Okay. I, I think he's repeating all the names to be like, oh, I didn't say I was a necromancer. I was, I'm just <laughs> right. a wizard. I'm a wizard, <laughs> right. Because <laughs> remember, this is back in the letter of the law days and stuff, and somebody trying to escape that. So, Yeah, it's kind of like our, some of the politicians today uh, yeah, you know, exactly. like changing their words <laughs> and saying, uh, uh, I, I, I said this word, or it depends on what is is, you know. Exactly. <laughs> Yes. Uh, anybody got Isaiah forty-seven thirteen yet? Thirteen. I got that. Um, thou art mm -hmm. wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. And by the way, that's a sarcasm. If you were to go study the context of that, exactly. That's exactly right. He's making fun of them. He's mocking them. Yes. God's mocking them. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's look at Deuteronomy 18.11 and 18.14. This has been condemned over and over again. Yeah, I've got a lot of references to this, but I'm, I'm just going to, I don't want to go too much on this because we move, need to move on to another one of the doctors. But let's look at this one and then we'll move on. Wasn't real fast, just real fast. Wasn't uh, it was a King Nebuchadnezzar and, and Daniel? Was that the king? Yes, Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. And then wasn't there was those were mediums, mediums that were trying to understand his dream that Daniel. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay thank you. Anybody got eight, Deuteronomy eighteen, eleven, and fourteen yet? Eighteen, eleven, and fourteen. Mm-hmm. I have them. Deuteronomy eighteen, eleven reads. For all these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Okay. Uh, I guess in context you'd have to read the before part. I think it's talking about these uh, uh, diviners and uh, charmers and stuff. Uh, uh, and then, uh, let's, do you read verse 14? Okay, verse 14 reads, For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearkened unto observations of times, and unto, div and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Okay. Um, I can give you probably a dozen or more verses that speak on this as and and basically criticizing and condemning this practice. So this is a something Mormonism does and the Bible condemns it. Uh, now let's go to uh, uh, the next teaching. Uh, 
I, I think real quick, Luke, real quick, that last verse that you pointed at, the last series, the important part there is to say you can't use this in such a way to say we're using this for the better of Israel. We're using this uh, in a good way. We're using this for God. He doesn't allow for that there. He, and that's the point he's making there. You know, he's... Yeah, yeah, he's making a point there, saying you can't say because I, I have, am not telling you this is something I want you to do. If you're going to get something, you're going to know it because it's going to come from me. I'm, I, I don't expect you to do these things, and I don't want you to do them in my name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Um, all right, uh, now the next doctrine of Mormons we're going to look at. It says uh, the Mormon Church believes in more than one God. Quote. This, this is Joseph Smith Jr. Quote. I will teach on the plurality of gods. We have three gods anyhow, and they are plural. Uh, that's History of the Church, 6, 6 colon, 4, 7, 5, 7, 6, Joseph Smith, Jr. And he goes on, quote, And you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests, the same as all gods before you, namely by going from one small degree to another. <laughs> So, uh, you know what else to be made clear is that Joseph Smith Jr. is the founder of Mormonism. Joseph Smith III was his son. So, just in case mm -hmm. that's confusing anybody watching this, this is yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Joseph Smith Jr. is the founder. Okay. Joseph Thank Smith Sr. has nothing that. to do with Mormonism. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. That was important. I didn't know know that, so that helped me too. Uh, Okay, so just before we look at any scriptures on this, it says that there's uh, um, many gods and that Mormon people can actually become gods, but they do it gradually, like one step at a time, you know, uh, through it, uh, one small degree to another. So uh, what's your first take on that before we look at scriptures? Why I think I think when you go back to the second video that we did on this, we pretty much crushed this idea multiple times when we discussed yeah. that God acknowledges absolutely no other gods besides Himself. So there right. can't be other gods and people who have lived uh, to achieve godhood like uh, like He supposedly did by living a life like we did in order to get there. It's not possible. He doesn't recognize anyone else as God. Yeah. Yeah, and those those verses, I'll uh, just re read them very quickly. Uh, uh, Isaiah forty three ten uh, and uh, Isaiah forty four six and Isaiah forty four eight and forty eight nine. It says, uh, "Before me there was no god formed, neither shall there be after me. Uh, that uh, thou shall have no other gods before me. Besides me there is no god. There is no god I know not any. I am God, and there is none like me." So over and over again, this over and over again, the Scripture declares monotheism. There is one God, and He was always God. He never was a man and became God. Okay, so yeah, you're right. We we don't need to go over that again. We covered that pretty thoroughly the the last session. Um, now let's uh, look at this teaching. The current teaching of the Mormon Church: only LDS have authority to baptize, ordain. They have a two-part system of priesthood, Aaronic and Melchizedek. Uh, uh, quote, uh, Man cannot act legally in the name of the Lord unless he is vested with the priesthood, which is divine authority. No man has the power or the right to take this honor to himself unless he is called of God, as was Aaron. He has no authority to officiate in any of the ordinances of the gospel. Should he do so, his act is not valid or recognized in the heavens. And that's Joseph Smith, Doctrine and Salvation. So, uh, It's interesting how they, kind of like the Catholics, deny the universal priesthood of believers. But the other interesting thing there is again, kind of like the Catholic Church, is notice how they're teaching institutional monopoly here. They're teaching institutional, you know, Jesus, because like Joseph said, all the other churches are an abomination, you know. Like, for example, we, on the other hand, we have our core beliefs, but most of us don't belong to any organization. But let's say, let's say a Southern Baptist were to come on this panel and totally agreed with the faith alone thing and everything. 
And then you also had a conservative Baptist who came on this panel to believe on the faith alone thing. And then you had someone like myself who's not a part of any denomination who agreed on the faith alone thing. My point is we'd all see those as being within the church in terms of God, God's people and everything, whereas they all need to belong to that specific institution. That, yes. The quote you just read really is ringing that to me, Luke. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, the word that comes to my mind is, is exclusivity, and, and uh, they're claiming exclusivity, and, and yet we know that Jesus himself claimed exclusivity. He said, right. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus claimed that he's the exclusive, exclusive way, and that Mormonism is taking that claim for themselves. Uh, now here's another one. Everyone pre-existed. Uh, quote, uh, uh, in, in, in the first stage, man was an eternally existent being termed an intelligence. In that sphere of existence, each individual was naturally conscious. When we completed our work in that realm and were permitted to go forward in the eternal process of progression, the next realm where man dwelt was the spirit world. That's the Gospel Through the Ages, Milton Hunter, page 127. Uh, this, this sounds, this, you could take this right out of a book from Shirley MacLaine. You know, it's nothing but spiritualism and yeah. uh, like reincarnation. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, the, the concept of pre-existence existence before birth I, I can't find anywhere in scripture you know the only thing is they try to use things like God foreknew us and everything as meaning he existed beforehand and I think you can see what a absurd jump that is and everything because to say that because God foreknew like you know the verse says he for, for whom he foreknew he also predestined yeah. I've heard them take that verse to mean the, the, like he knew before, not foreknew, but knew before, knew us before we were in our bodies or something like that. And right. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, okay, let's look at a few verses here that talks about pre-existing. Uh, Psalm 2-7. Okay, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Okay, what I'm pointing out is some verses that talks about the pre-existence, eternal existence of Christ. We know that God has uh, pre-existed and totally, eternally existed, uh, but man has not. Uh, so uh, if you look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, it talks about the pre-existence of Jesus as God and creator. Uh, let's go to John uh, 848, uh, 858. John 858. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Okay. And we know that that's a, a claim uh, of, of being a Jehovah. That's a Absolutely. Name. That's the name and, of Jehovah. Yes, and he knew they would understand it as that. That's exactly why he said it that way. Yeah, and then their reaction was they were going to stone him. Absolutely. Because, for blasphemy because they said, hey, he's he's a man, but he, he's claiming to be God. That's why exactly. we're going to stone him. Uh, let's look at uh, Colossians 5, uh, 15. Hmm. Colossians 15, 17. No, no, I don't know. Let's skip that one because I don't even know if I have the verse right. It looks like it's chapter 15 through chapter 17 in my notes. Okay, okay. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. All 
right. I got that one. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created he him, male and female created he them. Okay. Uh, so to have pre-existence, this eternal existence, uh, the, the only one in the, in the Bible that uh, we can see stated over and over again is pre-existent is God Almighty, um, Jesus Christ. And, no. and man, man is never declared in the Bible to be pre-existent and etern eternally existed. And he's, been, he's over, uh, he stated that he is created, not pre-existent. Someone was speaking. Well, I was just the only thing. I'm not. I'm. I mean, I think this is ridiculous. Don't get me wrong. But as the stretch, I think they do say we were created. We pre-existed. Not that we like always, always, always existed. But we were begotten by God the Mother and God the Father as spirit children at one point. Um, so just in case somebody thinks that that is a uh, is a legitimate point or something, mm -hmm. notice how much how much how contradictory that is of the verse we just read in twenty seven where he created them. That word created in Hebrew means to spontaneously um, create like 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 boom and it's there so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, it's well. Let me read the um, the quote again. Is he frozen? Uh oh, yeah, he's he, frozen. he locked up. Locked up for a few seconds, probably. <laughs> well, one, it, just kind of going along with what, with what you said, um, Jackson. The uh, what they believe is that we were, like you said, yes, we were birthed by the God Mother and the God Father, and uh, we then we were spirit beings for a point until we were sent here to be into mortal, so they knew us then, sent us to be immortal bodies to live a life so we could achieve godhood. Yeah. So we weren't yeah. actually gods at that point. We were born as these spirit children to them that had to go and be put into human bodies, so they knew uh -huh. us before, put us in these bodies, right. live lives, and then we go become gods. Right, and also what they think, building on top of that, is that they think that we are um, the the why Satan is so angry. Why Satan was supposedly so angry was because uh, he didn't have a physical body and he's jealous of ours, and that's why well, he tries to convince people of sexual impurity and stuff. Uh, well, well, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I heard that one before, but yeah, I that's knew what she that. Would emphatically say. I, I know his actual anger, they say, which caused his fall was actually that there was going to be a choice between Jesus or him to be Savior. Yeah. And they chose Jesus, and he got angry about that. Well, and so not exactly. And started a rebellion. Well, that, that was what I had read from yeah. – the well, guy, that, the guy was an ex-Mormon. Yeah. Well, that, that, uh, that's mostly true. The only nuance is that before they wanted him to like to have a choice. He was mad because he didn't want people to have free will, to have what they call free agency. See, the Mormon Church takes takes free will or agency to an extreme degree. It takes it to like this. Basically, it's not just like we. Most of us believe we have choices that we can make. They think that it's like we have this. I mean, they wouldn't phrase it this way, but it's almost like we have a superpower choice thing. And right, right, yeah. And Satan no, didn't agree. want to give man this agency, and Jesus did. The, the, the spirit children that went with Satan are the demons. The ones that went with Jesus are you and me. And originally in Mormonism, they taught that the spirits that remain neutral are the black people. Actually. Right. So what I so what I was really kind of breaking down was a more simplest version of yeah. the, the the outcome. You got into more the why as as yeah. to why that happened. Like, it's it's yeah, like there, there are yeah, reasons exactly. for the disagreement. Exactly. Exactly. And what's also funny about that, speaking of the black people thing, the the Mormon lady that I met, she actually said she thought that she was like, well, in the Bible it does say that Cain was cursed with a dark skin, doesn't it? And she's not racist or anything. But like, wait, what? I was like, I have never read in the Bible that Cain's skin turned dark and everything. 
And it's weird because she was like saying, well, I thought that was in the Bible or something. And then I asked her, and then some, when the subject came up more, her thought was, well, that, that was, it's not that the black people, but he just got a dark skin. And, she, and you know, the reports of Bigfoot, the legendary animal in the forest, <laughs> she actually thinks that the possible explanation is that might be Cain. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. She thinks that may be Cain out there. And that's why, that's what people are seeing. Well, yeah, because because their belief was that that the reason there are dark skinned people, the, the the black race, it came from people who were neutral. They they chose yeah. not to take any stand, and they were neutral, and so they put them in their own category. And I think that's why a lot of uh, people in the black community outright, you know, want to have they want to disavow anything to do with the Mormons yeah. too. Is why they had a lot of problems with uh, yeah, with Mitt weird. Romney because they realized that's in their in their uh, their belief yeah. system. Yeah, well, well, and and they they're always trying to distance themselves from it now. And ironically. There's actually a girl in my apartment building. Actually, I'm not positive she still lives here or not, but two floors down from me, who's black, who just converted to Mormonism recently, okay. like, like probably a year ago or something. And I thought to myself, I was because I accidentally wa walked into one of their meetings, and it was about baptism and everything, because I had locked myself out of my apartment, and I was. They were like, they were like, oh, we're gonna, have, we're just, we're just having this talk tonight, and it was about baptism, and it was. Basically, just believing baptismal regeneration, so you can mm -hmm. add that to the list of heresies too. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think I think in their case, as far as as far as her concerned, I, I think I don't think their take is, and I could be wrong on this, as far as the history of that, but I don't think their take is that they they um they exclude uh, black people. I, no. I think they see them as uh, finally picking a side, if you will. Like so, so when they come to them, they're yeah. actually picking the right side now, and they're well, then they. It wasn't until the seventies. Wasn't until the seventies that they could hold the priesthood in the Mormon Church. Okay. So. Uh, am I am I back with you guys? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I don't know. I cut out, but I uh, want to. I didn't think I was gone very long, but when I came back, you guys were talking about something totally different. So I don't know how you got into uh, <laughs> it, that. It, but, it uh, kind of morphed. <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I'd listen to that anyway. Yeah, uh, how, how it got there is you were talking about the pre-existence, and then we started talking about what happened in the pre-existence. That's how that whole thing unfolded. Right, I mentioned, you missed it. I mentioned to Austin that in the in the idea of us, I mean, uh, Jackson, I, I mentioned their, their philosophy is that we were birthed as spirit children prior to our existence as fleshly human beings. They knew us at that point, and then at some point we were sent to live in flesh bodies so that we could do what we have to do in these flesh bodies to earn our godhood. So that's that's how they knew us, how they see us as knowing us prior to, us existing prior to becoming human beings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's move on to this. I think this is the final uh, doctrine we'll discuss, so we'll take more time on this. But... Uh, but uh, the doctrine is there is no salvation outside the Mormon Church. Um, quote, man needs more than redemption from temporal death or the death of the body. He must also be redeemed from his fallen spiritual condition, which has arisen as a result of his own sins. Man cannot be redeemed from this spiritual death by an act of Christ alone. Uh, Without the atonement, the gospel, the priesthood, and the sealing power, there would be no salvation. If it had not been for Joseph Smith and the restoration, there would be no salvation. There is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, unquote. Mormon Doctrine, pages 669 to 671. So we did uh, talk about the exclusivity. There are various other uh, uh, religions and uh, sects of Christianity that also claim this exclusivity, as we as we talked about. But they think that uh, the main problem is they think that salvation is uh, cannot be accomplished simply by what Jesus did, our faith in Him and what He did. Right. But, uh, there's there's more requirements. This sounds like a, another group of people that we talk about a lot. Who, who comes to mind? The Lordship Salvationists. Yeah. There, there yeah. are several, several yeah. groups. Just your typical church. <laughs> your, t your typical church in America. Yeah. Whether it's all the Roman Catholic churches around the country, or right. whether it's all the various uh, denominational and even non-denominational churches, all have statement of faith, 
that uh, that you are saved uh, by repenting of your sins and and surrendering your life and believing in Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of Christendom today is very similar to Mormonism in their claim that uh, faith in Jesus is insufficient. Right. That more is required. Right. That you've got to do your part, and they all have their own list of requirements. Mormons just say one of the requirements is you got to be a Mormon. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, interestingly, you may or may not know this about the Mormons: is did you know that they don't like to display the cross? For example. Yeah. Yeah. That's why there's there's none on their on their buildings. They don't. Put yeah. Cross instead, they have that that picture of Jesus. That's total guesswork of what he looked like, but. The the thing is like I remember like I have I have a Christian flag in my room here. It's like it, it's got the it's the white one with the cross the, the red cross and the and the blue square. But anyway, like they wouldn't like that and they don't they don't like anything with a cross displayed on it, but and they, they would they would say it's because well we don't want to delight in his suffering or something like that. But it's interesting. I think a lot of it is probably because they don't believe that that's what saves you. They don't believe that that's enough, the shedding of his blood and everything. Hmm. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, I've heard, I don't know where I read this or heard it, but uh, they believe that the, the, the atonement of, for, that Jesus did was not on the cross, but was in Gethsemane when he was sweating yes. the pure yes. blood. Yes, they yes. do. They do. They do not. They, or they think, what one Mormon missionary told me is they think that both were like a part of it or something, is what he was talking about. Mike, I think if you look at some of their leaders, sometimes they state things more strongly than some of the members, even the ones who know about this, are, are comfortable with. But like this guy told me it was both. I've read some from the leaders that seem like it's. It's not his death on the cross. It was his bleeding in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is. Right. It's interesting how I was because this was one lady who was a Mormon who told me all this. She was like, "Well, I think if you read in the Bible, you'll find all these verses about how he atoned in Gethsemane and not the cross." And I looked at it. And I could not find a single one that was supporting her her claim about the Gethsemane. I could not find a single one because to them. The Bible verses are the footnotes, like I talked about last time and everything. You know, these footnotes, they read those and they actually literally believe those are more inspired than Scripture because the church leaders put those in there and everything. So the, the hard thing about talking to a Mormon, if you're trying to win one to Christ or something, because, I mean, I mean, it's, it's it, it, I need to be careful how I say this, but undoing what they've learned and everything is a really hard process because it's like cemented, almost like the, how it's cemented in our minds that the scripture is the word of God. It's like that's what they have cemented as their what their church officials say and believe and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some notes here on the other sects of Mormonism that we you've touched on a little bit, uh, Jackson. And I'll, I'll, I'll read these if we can comment. Uh, and I'd forgotten I even had this. Uh, uh, the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Years after Joseph Smith's death in 1859, the new church was established. Its headquarters set up in Independence, Missouri, where Joseph Smith had declared by revelation Zion would be built. The decision was made that the presidency of the new church should descend in the line of the original prophet. The reorganized church holds many of the same beliefs as the Mormons. The following list describes their differences. God is unchangeable. Men may develop in righteousness into, into any degree of glory, uh, not becoming gods as Mormons believe. Uh, except doctrine and covenants written by before Smith's death, they do not accept the Pearl of Great Price. The Book of Mormon is accepted as being the Word of God. Joseph Smith's inspired version of the Bible is accepted. Uh, one last thing. They do not practice baptism for the dead. They reject polygamy. Marry only one time. They do not have the elaborate priesthoods nor the temple initiatory rites. Uh, they have a system of pastors elected from the eldership who preach sermons, they trust in good works for salvation instead of putting complete faith in Christ and his redeeming work. So what's your your reaction to, to this group, of, this sect of Mormonism? Oh, 
Well, my my take on that is, you know, this is one of the what we talked about the factions that are are branching off that are trying to maybe maybe make themselves uh, more acceptable in the public eye by changing some ideals that people don't exactly agree with. They have a harder time developing concepts. You know, they they, they can't really um, get people to accept these things. They say, well, let's make it so that they we can get people to be a little bit more accepting of this. Yeah. Now, it should be noted, to be fair, though, Eric, the community of Christ slash RLDS that, that uh, Joseph... Uh, that Joseph Smith the third started and um, that Luke just read about they have never been as radical as the regular Mormon church which is kind of interesting because you would think the le the less radical would be the mainstream and that's not the case like for example they do not like to be one thing I just happen to know about them because for years I just researched Mormonism all the time but they they don't like to be called Mormons. They just like to be called Christians and everything. And the main difference they have from our beliefs is number one, they accept the Book of Mormon as being true and everything. They accept doctrine and covenants as also being true. They would claim they would claim it's misinterpreted by the other church. They reject the pearl of great price. But here's here's the interesting the most interesting thing is they still teach basically a work salvation. They even renounced the idea that they were a restoration. Like, remember how we talked about in the first, sh or last time, we talked about how the Mormons claim to be a restoration? Mm -hmm. Originally, this group taught that too. They've renounced that, but they still have not renounced that, like, discipleship and repenting or whatever plays a part with it and everything, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. But again, this this comes back to the well. You're you're. It's like a you know. I know the joke's been there, but I'll use it again. It's it's like a salad bar. You know, you pick the parts you like and you leave the rest. I mean, you can't you, you can't establish. I mean, there are lots of things in Christianity. Is one of the things that gets me about Christianity has always convinced me about the Bible. Even early as a Christian, I look at the Bible and I look at other religious groups. The Bible forces you to look at yourself in a way that is very uncomfortable for you to look at yourself. It says things about you that as a person with human goals, the way you're brought up in the world, that you just don't want to accept. Every other, every other religious belief out there seems to be based on human rationale with human desires in mind, and this comes through with these beliefs. So if certain things about it make us uncomfortable, well, we'll change that. We'll pick that piece out. We'll call ourselves something else. Now, I understand you're trying to be fair about that, and that's fine, and I realize there are groups that don't hold to the, to the ideals that are – you know, the more radical ideals from the beginning, but once again, then you come back to the whole thing. Well, then, well, then, what are you? I mean, what, 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 yeah. what, what's your foundation? Yeah, a work salvationist is the answer to what. Right. What are you? Pretty much. Right. It's it's like what you know. What what is your foundation? The Christian always goes back and says, "Look, my foundation is the Word of God. My foundation is Christ. Faith in Christ. Grace. That's my foundation." These. It's like well, we can shift and move the foundation, and Jesus tells us about. You know, foundations that aren't solid. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, if you go to my uh, my channel and look at the playlist Mormonism debunked, I have a few videos there that are made by former Mormons who are uh, have advanced very high in the hierarchy of Mormonism, held high offices, and then they left, and now they're teaching against it. And uh, sometimes that's the best way to. To understand uh, Mormons and uh, you know the, the the errors and but the um, so I hope that people will actually take some time and, and uh, do that too. But what I'm getting here, I've got a couple more sects of Mormonism I want to talk about. But what I see hap has happened in Mormonism is the same thing happens with every group and, and even within our own groups on YouTube is that uh, uh, you're part of a group. And then, uh, as soon as you're discussing everything, you find little areas you disagree on, and instead of allowing disagreement, everybody gets into the fight, and they got to form their own sect and divide. And now, now you have uh, divisions and factions, and these are almost like denominations of Mormonism. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, I agree. Uh, this next one is called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints Strangeite. I think is how it's pronounced. Strangeite. Uh, the followers of Strang accept the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and the Law of the Lord. The Law of the Lord is scripture written by Strang, which he received in a vision. 
Then on, there's another one called the Church of Jesus Christ Bicker Tonight. The Bicker Tonight Church has a missionary outreach to the Apache Indians at San Carlos, Arizona. Also a group in Africa have joined the group. Then you got the Church of Jesus Christ Hendrickite. Uh, this church is located in Independence, Missouri and holds the property of the Temple Lot which was set aside for the Temple of Zion. A prophecy of Joseph Smith's claim the temple would be built on this property by the generation of 1832. <clears throat> the Temple Lot Church is located across the square from the tabernacle of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and proudly displays the stone bearing the initials of Joseph Smith and the date 1831. Both the reorganized church and the Utah church have sought to gain possession of the lot by both purchase and litigation, but the temple lot is not for sale and the property has been adjudicated as belonging to the present owners. Uh, one more is auto fetting, uh, Church of Christ Fettingite. Auto fetting was ordained an apostle of the temple lot church in 1926. Fetting claimed to have had a two-hour conference with John the Baptist on November 30, 1930. The messages continue to come. They emphasize the building of the temple and the establishment of Zion. And then the last group that you might have heard of is called the Fundamentalists. Um, uh, they are the, the pol polygamists in Utah and the West. At least 13 separate groups loosely knit are in identifiable. The fundamentalist as a whole belonged to families that were prominent in the church during the 19th century. The fundamentalist movement developed out of the decision to stop the practice of polygamy and did not constitute the organization of a new church. They consider themselves to be the orthodox section of the Utah church. The Salt Lake Church has a policy of excommunicating any polygamous members. It has been estimated that there are some 30,000 people in Utah involved in polygamous families. So I guess that's uh, all of them. Maybe there's others that I've uh, missed, but uh, you can see that there's probably a half dozen different sects uh, that, ref that think of themselves as, as Mormons or LDS. Um, I think we should dedicate the rest of the time to talking about uh, what each of us would think as the, the, the big problem with Mormonism. Uh, we, we've talked about a lot of their strange beliefs. We've shown that uh, these are not biblical in nature. They're extra biblical, uh, either from uh, one of the um, founders of Mormonism's own teachings or through some revelation they got through some kind of spirit medium or uh, uh, and the, so these are and they clearly contradict uh, many of the teachings of the Bible so uh, but how, out of everything we've discussed and if there's something that we didn't discuss try to nail down one or two things or three things you think are really the critical problems with Mormonism and uh, and then express how, if you think all these other things, uh, you know, how serious those are. Um, uh, if you don't, you don't mind, guys, I'll go ahead and start. Um, the, um, the single greatest thing that you have to start with here is uh, taking away Christ's finished work at the cross. Once you start with that, you eliminate <coughs> that and say what he did was not enough. Everything else is just semantics. It's Because when you, when you start from there and you've killed that, you can say whatever else you want because you've destroyed salvation. You've just you've left it. Okay. okay uh, I want to elaborate on these too, but I would see if anybody wants to uh, comment on Eric or make it a different point. I think um, a large, large problem in Mormonism, in addition to what Eric said, and it goes very hand in hand with it, is they're trusting man's teaching. You know, they're trusting, they're, they're trusting something like, like Eric said earlier about the Bible painting a very unflattering picture of us. On the other hand, Mormonism loves to teach, you know, we're all a little good inside, kind of thing. You know, be a good person. You're already good, but be better, kind of thing. And 
then you've got people like Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and all these leaders that we've been writing quotes from just saying this stuff, you know. It wasn't all the things with the signs and the Bible or anything. It just seems to me almost like, I don't know, people write, writing a, a, like, like a book or something, you know, like a strange fictional book or something. So I would, I would be very cautious about uh, man's understanding, which it seems like Mormonism is built, built upon. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Hey, Austin, uh, what thoughts come to your mind? Uh, yeah, mostly that. Just uh, stop adding to the, you know, front-loading the gospel or changing the changing the salvation message. As soon as faith alone and Christ alone for salvation alone is changed, you usually have a, have a problem. I always look at it as... Uh, God is uh, God is very simple, but He's perfect. Uh, God is very simple, but He's reliable. God is very simple, but He's righteous. Uh, no matter what uh, we may not understand, uh, it's a childlike faith, and people uh, we overlook that too often. Uh, a lot of it is with the uh, with the this. I'm not sure if it's a new teaching, but I guess it's uh, it's coming back a lot with. Uh, New, I guess, new Bible teachers. It's uh, you need to believe the gospel in order to be saved. Well, look at it this way: if I just gave you the gospel, and uh, that was all I gave you, you wouldn't be saved. And it, it, why would uh, why would you not be saved? Because it's a bunch of facts. You know, if you believe a bunch of facts, you're no different than the people who believe two plus two equals four. Yeah, it's a fact, but it won't save you. What saves you is the blood of Jesus and faith alone in Christ. Uh, Christ alone is what saves, and uh, we, it's a crucial and critical fact that when we start adding to the gospel, we uh, we change it. And uh, necessarily, we always look at a perverted gospel as something that is uh, is changed. And uh, another uh, abstract teaching is this: uh, you know, once you're a new creature, you're you know, you never sin, or uh, you have to be a new creature. And in uh, in this manner, the new creature part is it goes hand in hand with being born again, and born again goes hand in hand with salvation, and salvation goes hand in hand with repentance. Once someone repents of unbelief to salvation and faith alone by Christ, they are automatically born again, and the new creature isn't themselves; it's Christ dwelling within them, and therefore it's a change of a, uh, a of your of your uh, supernatural it's a supernatural rebirth it's that's the change of creature you know you've been changed in that manner not change of action or change of desire change from sinning it is a supernatural change and uh, what I just want to touch is that it, all these points all of them happen at the same exact time as someone just realizes that it is a simple childlike faith based upon Jesus Christ alone for salvation that you can never lose and then you'll achieve everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Hey, well, well said, Austin. Uh, Tanya? She okay. said be right back a while ago. All right, what, what I want to know is... Um, uh, each person touched on some things that I think are critically important and critically wrong with Mormonism. But first, let me ask you: uh, of all these different doctrines of Mormonism, uh, which and how many of them do you think are basically forgivable? In other words, okay, we can prove that they're wrong by Scripture, but uh, it, it's it's not a salvation issue. Uh, in other words. Uh, let's say that a Mormon was saved, um, and yet they believed a lot of these doctrines that we've been talking about. Which of these doctrines you think are uh, kind of forgivable? They're kind of us. Uh, we can accept it. We, we we know they're wrong. We'll we'll dispute it with them and correct them, but it's not going to classify them as as uh, lost. Well, I just want to say if they're saved, uh, they're saved regardless. Uh, salvation isn't based upon uh, anything we can do. If we, if it's nothing that we uh, we do to earn, there's nothing we can do to lose it. And uh, in a sense, if uh, I know there's a lot of people that sometimes change their ideas, uh, no matter. Uh, we'll stick to Mormonism, but I'm just saying it happens all throughout life. Uh, sometimes they get saved, they turn to atheists. Sometimes they get saved and live worldly. I mean, it's. Uh, the we always love to judge the outside, but uh, thank God He looks at our hearts for the inside, and He knows uh, He knows when that commitment was made. But uh, if if they were saved and they believed a lie, they're they're still saved. They'll lose 
uh, rewards, of course, and uh, you know there might be further penalties and loss of blessings throughout life. But uh, once they're saved, they're uh, they're saved indefinitely forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we we all agree. We all hold to that doctrine of uh, once you're saved, then you could fall into apostasy and not lose your salvation. But uh, what I'm talking about is just of all these weird doctrines that they have. Um, do you think that these weird doctrines are? Um, I don't know how else to say it, but basically just forgivable. Okay, all the all right, you're in error, and we can show you're in error from the scriptures, uh, and yet uh, that's not the obstacle. That's not why you're not well, saved. I mean, the, the thing that makes it so hard, I would say, is many of these doctrines just go absolutely hand in hand with their work salvation. You know, for example, believing in a pre-existence that we chose good and that's why we're here and everything. I mean, maybe if somebody was so inconsistent they could, I guess, believe that and believe on Christ for salvation, but that would require incredible inconsistency because the whole point of that system of their agency doctrine of coming to earth, having sided with God, and that's what makes us the white people. Okay, there's, let me give an example. Uh, I skipped over this because there's there are certain doctrines that, that I had listed here, but uh, to save time, I, I didn't cover it. But uh, uh, they believe that uh, Jesus was conceived in Mary, uh, not by the the Holy Spirit coming over them over Mary, but the but the Father actually having sexual intercourse with Mary. Now. Now, to us, we certainly know that that's not what the Scripture says. That's some imagination of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young or somebody that dreamed up that idea, you know. But uh, that's an, I think that's an example of, uh, well, that, that's not, uh, that doesn't really change. Uh, that's not a salvation issue, is it, even though it's a horrible mistake? Yeah, I would yeah. say, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that I was going to say is the problem with that is it's very difficult because if because I I, th I think I see what you're getting at the, the the problem there is if you begin to change who Christ is, then it changes who you're accepting for salvation mm -hmm. and what you're accepting for salvation. So if you if you begin by saying well, um, yes, I believe that God sent Jesus as this person. He's the only way, but he's not God. Um, but 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 he is the only way to believe, and and through what he did, God finds is has me approved by that. But but he but but he wasn't God. I mean, you're not really accepting Christ because the Bible says this is who he is. You're 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 doing it conditionally and saying, but this condition hasn't been met for me. So I don't. I'm not really accepting really who who he is. So at, at essence, you're not really accepting what he did then. Well, in this example, I, I think that it doesn't change uh, who he is, whether it was the Holy Spirit that somehow uh, uh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but not a physical sex act, or whether it was the Father in an in a actual physical body who had sex with, with Mary. I mean, I'm the, the idea is, is just, sound, I'm sure it sounds horrible to everybody. It sounds horrible to me. It's contrary to scriptures, and it's not. Right. Uh, but uh, but at the same time, it would not affect the deity of Christ. He would still be God in that case. But my, I'm just trying to make the point that I think that some of the things they believe are crazy, but not as serious. And then there's some of the things that they believe they're really, really serious, and they need to be get those things right. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a it's a salvation issue, and. Uh, yeah, it's it's hard for me to know which is which is the point I'm trying to make here. That's what's really hard for me because, like you said, I think that the Virgin Mary is repulsive as repulsive as that doctrine is. You're, I think you're right about that one. But if somebody believes in deification as they do, for example, it's hard for me to know which category that falls into because that I, I, it seems like it just murkies the water so much. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right, and uh, I, listening to your comments, I made a few notes, and then I ended up concluding that really what uh, we need to look at them is how, how do they fit with the, the uh, five solas. 
Mm -hmm. And someone mentioned that they have extra biblical writings. And Sola Scriptura says that uh, Scripture is our sole source for our theology. We do not get our former theology uh, based upon anything outside of what is uh, the Scriptures. Uh, uh, now, people might, uh, I know there's a lot of people that think that uh, they, uh, the Holy Spirit is teaching them and that, uh, and I'm sure that's true, to, uh, the Holy Spirit helps us understand, but if, if the Holy Spirit makes you understand something and then your understanding disagrees with the Scriptures, then you'd have to say that that was not the Holy Spirit, it was a different spirit. And uh, so the first problem they have is that they do not trust the Scriptures, instead they trust the writings of men, whether it's the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, or any of their other writings. So that's where the problem begins. Feel free to comment on that, and then I'll make my next point. Now, I know, Luke, though, that you don't hold to the... Even though you firmly hold to the inerrancy of Scripture, as all of us on this panel do, I don't think you hold that somebody has to believe that in order to be saved, do you? No, I, I didn't hope... I wasn't trying to give you that impression. I hope you, I didn't miss, uh, you didn't misunderstand. A person to be saved doesn't even have to know there's a Bible. Mm -hmm. And the person, a person to be saved could actually think the Bible is wrong in a lot of ways, I think. Uh, uh, but the, uh, what I'm talking about is um, sola script, the principle that our, do we go to the Bible to learn the truth about theology. We don't go to, uh, you know, men's writings. And, uh, uh, but a person doesn't have to, you know, read the whole Bible. I mean... Uh, there's people we know who haven't even they're Christians and out there teaching and and uh, and very doing very good ministry work and haven't even read the Bible from cover to cover. So it's not a requirement, but I think that the sola scriptura principle is just saying that look, if, if if you want truth about God, go to the scriptures to get it. You don't go to men's writings, okay? And that's their first mistake. And then you got sola gratia. Grace alone. Uh, grace means that uh, that's God is being gracious. The only reason we can be saved is because because God is given us grace and we don't deserve it. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace means that God is gracious and and giving you something wonderful that you don't deserve. Okay, so uh, they fail in in uh, in sola gratia because they're trying to base salvation on the fact that they are working for it and earning it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then and then we have uh, uh, sola fide, fide, and that, that is uh, faith only faith. God's part is grace; He's being gracious. Our part is faith. And that's the only thing that's required, uh, and, and, they, and yet they they reject that and say faith is not enough. That all of these ordinances and rules and regulations that they put forth are required. And when we could give them dozens of verses that say nothing's required except faith. Believe in Jesus, and you're and you're saved, and nothing else. Baptism, ordinances. Good works, all those things. None of that's required. So uh, they fail. They their religion fails on solely feeding. Uh, and then you got full sola uh, sola Christus, and then that, that is Christ alone. Our faith must be in Christ. And this is where I have a, a problem with some people we know, is that they're putting their faith as as uh, uh, Austin mentioned earlier. They're, they're putting their faith in, in, in getting a lot of the facts right and, and learning all the facts and believing in the facts. And I say no. Uh, sola, sola Christus means that Jesus is the sole source or object of our faith. Our faith in, is in this person, not in the fact that we understand all the facts about him necessarily correctly before we get saved or after we get saved. We could be wrong about certain facts or maybe not even know all the facts. But our, Jesus is the sole object of that faith. That's sola Christus. And then you got the final 
And so they, obviously their faith is not in Jesus, their faith is in themselves and Joseph Smith and the, and the, and the founders of their religion. And then their final, uh, final mistake, of course, and this is, all these things could be thrown across the board to many of the Protestant churches and Roman Catholic Church today too, the same thing applies. They, then they fail in the fa final test of uh, sola, uh, sola Gloria. You see, they're stealing glory from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ deserves all the glory. And if, if you think that, that you have anything to do with earning your salvation, and, the, and the, then you're taking credit for yourself instead of giving all the glory and credit to Jesus. So that's to me where they, they're failing is that in their religion, they fail in all these points that are, these are all really essential things to, to uh, make the puzzle like fit like a glove. I mean, obviously, if you don't believe in, in uh, faith alone, then you don't believe in glory, all the glory for Jesus. Because you, you know, you're saying that what he did is not enough, he, he, he was insufficient, and you need to do your part, and therefore you can share in the glory. Yes. So, so uh, that's how I see it. These, all these problems apply to what we've studied about Mormonism. Every well, I, one of them. I think one of the things, one of your original questions when you first started asking this before you went into the five solas, um, which are all great points, um, is you, you were kind of saying, well, what happens if you have the difficult idea, let's say somebody, according to what we believe in salvation, has accepted Christ. They've accepted Christ as the sole proprietor of their salvation he is it is uh, what he has done alone and they got faith in him then they still choose to be i think it was your original question they still choose to be part of one of these sects you know how do we how do we deal with that and i think this falls under the category that paul paints which is a lot of churches he had to deal with in the early days of his ministry when he was going around these were churches that were they never grew because instead of seeking their knowledge from the Holy Spirit and putting their faith, like you said, in the Word, in God's glory, as Christ, Christ's glory is the focus, uh, all, the, all the things in the five solos that you mentioned, they were left stagnant. And as a result, it stunted any kind of growth they would ever possibly have. They could, he couldn't bring them the meat because they weren't, they weren't growing. They, they, were, they were allowing people to come in and do all these things, uh, people to influence them to obey the law instead of worrying, it's, instead of being more concerned that their faith has saved them. Um, they were carnal. They, were, they, they had all these problems that were stunting them, so he, he could only give them milk. He wanted to give them meat, but he could only give them milk. What it does is it, it kills any further walk you're going to have because you're, you're not listening to the direction of the Holy Spirit. You're saying, well, I've accepted Christ, and this is what a lot of Christians who who agree with us on faith do, and then they simply choose not to do anything to grow. They 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 just choose. Well, I got saved, and I'm going to sit here. Are they saved? Yeah, they're saved. They may even stick with some of their carnal actions that they do, and they're still saved because they've accepted Christ for their salvation and trusted in Him. But as a Christian, they'll never be productive. They'll never go anywhere. They'll never they'll never bear anything useful or or gain any of the knowledge that God wants to reward them with because they're not going to the Holy Spirit for their knowledge. They're going to men. They're going to these other sources. They're trusting in other ways. They're saying, well, I've accepted Christ, but as far as learning the facts and getting all this down, I want to get this from what this guy wants to tell me. I want to get it from what this guy wants to tell me, from this book I read, from this book. They, they want to feel their way through life instead of simply letting the Holy Spirit give them that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you said the word feel because that just reminded me of something. Um, how many people have had much many interactions with Mormons? I, or you've witnessed to them, or witnessed to you? I have. Okay, then tell me if the, if you've ever heard this from uh, Mormon. Um, have you? They'll ask you, have you ever read the Book of Mormon? And you, if you say, well, no. Or I say, well, 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 just do one thing for me. Just do this one thing. I'm asking you to do one thing. Read the Book of Mormon, and then just pray for uh, to uh, whether it's true or not. And and then uh, you'll get your answer, and you'll get this burning in your bosom. Burning in the bosom is their slogan for your heart is telling you it's true. And they're convinced that if you'll read it and pray about it, you'll get this revelation in your heart. You'll know it's true. Okay. Uh, 
How, have you ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Yes, many yes. times. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a standard operating procedure for Mormons. I want you to read the book and then pray about it, and you get the burning in the bosom. Um, so there's there's a couple of verses that come to mind. Uh, uh, maybe you can look this up. Uh, Jeremiah seventeen nine. Did you want somebody to look it up, Lou? Yeah. Uh, well, I know it. I've got it memorized. If you want to look it up, you can confirm this. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. So a Mormon is asking you to trust your heart. Go with your feelings. And the scripture says, no, no. the heart is deceitful <laughs> above all things and desperately wicked. So they, they're they going to make their decision whether Mormonism is true based upon how their heart feels. Yeah, instead of, that, instead that of studying and learning the truth, go ahead, uh, Jack. I was just, just going to say, what you're saying right now is absolutely right, and it could also be applied to some charismatics that I know, too. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now we've got another one. Another one just like it. So funny, real quick, Luke, it's so yeah. funny because this exact discussion I was just having with my son the other day, I mean, just not a couple days ago, the exact same discussion about people telling you, follow your heart. Don't listen to people when they tell you that for that very reason you just mentioned. So that's good. Good stuff. Yeah. So write this one down, too, then, for your son and anybody else, um, any Mormon, Proverbs 28, 26. And it says, he who trusts his own heart is a fool. Mm -hmm. So these verses I like to tell Mormons when they tell me, well, just pray and get that burning in your bosom, and that's your heart, and you, you just go by what your heart tells you. So I, I don't want to get my base my conclusions based upon my heart, my feelings, my own reasoning. I, I'm going to base it by what the Scripture says. That gets back to this sola scriptura question again. The um, what was the original verse in Jeremiah that you mentioned? Jeremiah it was seventeen nine. Seventeen nine. Okay. Yeah. Didn't Paul mention too not to trust your heart? Uh, I don't know. I think I read somewhere in the in the New Testament that uh, Paul was uh, he spoke out against not trusting the your heart because it will uh, it will deceive you as well. Yeah, yeah very well maybe. Um, so. Uh, I've got. I stated in the first episode. There's. This is the third and final episode on Mormonism, and in the very first one, the first thing I did was lay out my uh, how to disprove Mormonism and ha and and why I think people are Mormons and stay Mormons. Uh, you, I don't know if you remember what I said, but I'm going to ask everybody to pose their theories on this. How to uh, talk to a Mormon? How to show them that Mormonism is wrong? And, and then also, why is it you think people become Mormons uh, or stay Mormons? Okay. Okay, and uh, feel free to, to go anytime. <laughs> well, the I'll go first. Uh, I think the biggest key on uh, to anybody that uh, you're trying to witness to is uh, just give them sound, sound biblical doctrine of uh, grace by uh, saved by grace by faith. Uh, the reason uh, being is the best way that you'll ever, not necessarily an argument, but the best way you'll ever over achieve a, a debate is uh, only uh, God's word, and uh, I, I remember Paul, it's a very wonderful verse by Paul, he, uh, he says that, uh, for Christ did not send me, or, uh, for, <clears throat> I'll look it up, I'm sorry, I'll look it up, I'll, I'll post it later, but he's, he, what he was saying was, don't use your words of wisdom to convince somebody, you, use, use God's word, because God's word will convict them to the heart as, uh, as uh, Jesus said, "The Holy Spirit is sharper; it pierces through the, uh, pierces right to the heart." And then, uh, why people become these false religions, false cults, 
Uh, it could be uh, multiple different uh, different views. One of them would possibly be uh, acceptance or uh, maybe uh, fellowship. I know that uh, David, Day, David J. Stewart calls, uh, he says that most Christians aren't uh, Christian, uh, they don't have Christianity, they have churchianity. They, uh, they like the idea, they like the look of it. Uh, so, di just different views on it, uh, but uh, basically the hands down, no matter who you, uh, who you ever come across that you're always trying to witness to, is just uh, lead them by God's word, and, you know, as soon as we start getting into our own interpretation of how to deal with it, we uh, will fall short pretty much every time, because we'll, we'll agree with our views, and then they'll stick with their views, and then you don't get any progress done. Hmm. Well, let me say something uh, uh, to Austin before we go on to the next person. Uh, uh, I've said that to me, and I, I agree with your point about we might cut, we use scriptures, but I believe the best way to use scriptures is not argue scriptures with people, but just simply show them a scripture, ask them to read it, and ask them to explain it to you. Then it's not like an ego thing of trying to prove one thing or another. You just show them a clear scripture that uh, that says Jesus is God, or that there is only one God. There never has been another God, or that or that uh, the works have no part in our salvation. One clear and disputable verse, and just say, could you explain this verse to me? Just interpret it. Tell me what what it means. And that that way, when they have to figure out and explain it to you, it it has more of an impact on them by far than you trying to argue and prove your point with them. So. Uh, that's what I would say about you know, using the scriptures in that way. Um, okay, Eric? I would say, you know, with, as, as is with anything, if you're going to engage in something like this, and any Christian who's not really familiar, who's a young Christian who's not really experienced with this, I, I would ask you to hesitate before you get into something like this with somebody. Because one of the things you need to do is two steps. You have to educate yourself about what these people believe. You have to know a little something about what they're going to be bringing to the table. You got to be prepared and know a little something. Second, you got to be educated in your scripture. You've got to be in your scripture, studying on a really a daily basis, so that as you just said, Luke, you have the verses to be able to show them so they can read. So you have it. You are ready to have this discussion, not an argument, like you said. It, it should never be an argument. It's got to be something because you're not going to win anybody through an argument like that. It's just not going to happen. It's got to be something where you draw the person, you guide them to the path where they're learning this themselves. If you can reveal these things to themselves, and a lot of that too also is trust in the Holy Spirit. God says he'll give you the words. He'll give you the words when you need them. And so, so, but, but still, educate yourself in these things. Be ready if you if you plan on trying to do something like this. That's the biggest thing I would say. Okay. And the other part of the question was, why is it you think people become Mormons and remain to be remain in Mormonism? Well, I think I think we touched on that today. I think one of the reasons they be, they they join Mormonism is some of the reasons that anybody joins a religious group for for a reason. They they want to belong. They want to believe their life uh, has meaning in something. They want to believe that they belong to something that's important. That's uh, th that really amounts to something huge on the scale of. Of life. I mean, it's all you know. The saying we all have a God-shaped hole that only God can fill. Well, you know, this is that hole they're trying to fill with something else. And the reason that you find, again, in most other false religions, is well, when you're told in this religious belief, with which is people are very much brainwashed into it at an early point. It, they do this and then press upon you. We have the only way. You leave this. And they put fear into you of leaving it. You better not leave because we got the only way. They put fear into you, and that's the way people. That's one of the reasons people stay. It becomes so ingrained in you. Um, I grew up early in Roman Catholicism, and even though I didn't really accept the things they believed after a time, you know, I still, for a while, still found myself trying to defend points of view that I didn't even really agree with, just because I felt over that time that I, for some reason, deserved, it, it deserved my defense, like I was supposed to defend it. And it just, it's funny how that happens to you, but it does. Okay, yeah, very good, thank you. Okay, Jackson, same question to you is, uh, 
you, how would you think it would be the best way to witness to talk to a Mormon and your theory on why people become Mormons or remain Mormons? Okay, to start with your first question about how to witness to one, in my opinion, the best way, this is just, just my opinion, but to talk to a, a Mormon or Lordship Salvationist or Catholic or someone something like that is, what I like to bring up is assurance, you know. You could ask the Mormon missionaries, are you sure you're doing enough good works? How many good works is the standard? And they'll often try to give you vague answers, like, well, as long as my lifestyle is generally characterized by it. And my advice to that, and this is, this is what, what I've learned after talking to several people, you know, some Mormons, some not, some are just Lords of Salvation, is don't let it go. Don't let them just say, oh, well, that's general, and just kind of nod your head, say, no, no, no. I, don't, I think if, if your eternal destiny depends on it, you better have an exact calculation, and how are you going to calculate your life? So I would really, really go after that assurance thing, you know, I guess in a classic Bob Wilkin sort of style. But anyway, as far as why people become Mormons, um, it's very hard for me to know, frankly. It's so... Uh, what what appeals to a lot of people about Mormonism doesn't really appeal to me. But the thing is, I was talk I've been talking to my therapist lately about how neurotypicals work and stuff. Not since I'm not a neurotypical, and they have stronger mirror neurons than I do, which means they feel other people's emotions in a sensational way that I don't. Even if I empathize with someone, I'm not feeling it like a neurotypical person is doing. So therefore, I think they kind of build this this family values and this family bond and we're there for you and we help each other out financially and we we, um, we pray for each other and they basically make it like a social club and the mirror neurons start reacting and reacting and reacting and reacting and it ends up sticking like glue is my theory mm -hmm. yeah very, very good brother and uh, I also want to say while I'm thinking about it I think I mentioned to everybody before, but now, now that we're live, I want to say this again. Uh, Brother Jackson made a video yesterday, I think it was, that's one of the best videos I've ever seen on YouTube. And I hope everybody will watch it, and I hope you'll all share it, because uh, it really needs to be seen. And uh, what's the name of that, that video again, Jackson? The one I made today, the yeah, Lord, today, Introduction yeah. to the Lordship Controversy. Yeah, introduction to the lordship controversy. Uh, the way the way that you uh, explained the uh, the situation and uh, presented it was just awesome. So, please, everybody, you should watch that. And uh, thank you so much, Luke. Share thank it. You. Share it. Okay, and Stefania. Okay. There is a loud helicopter. <laughs> uh, can Can you talk? Yeah, is it too loud? Uh, just a little bit, just a tiny bit, a little bit down lower. It's kind of like a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> it freaked me out. I was like, what? It's really loud. Yeah, that's um, exactly. As far as why people join Mormonism, I'm, I agree with what Jackson and um, Eric said, and I missed what Austin said if he said anything again, but I um, agree with all that, and then I would just add that it's, you know, I think part of it is and I'm just talking about people who join it as an adult. The only way that I would do something like that is if the whole idea of something new, of you know, ah, oh, I know something that you don't. I've got this, you know, special understanding that most people don't have. Ooh. I mean, that's very seductive, and I think that that has a lot to do with it. Why? Thank you. <laughs> very good and point. As far as witnessing, yeah, I would just stick with scripture. And like Jackson said, don't let things go. I've noticed that that's a very good uh, way to go about it. Is just stick with points and almost, it's almost like you got to talk to them like like a child. And I, I don't mean that in a, in a mean kind of way. I'm just saying very clear, simple, to the point. You know, like that. Little things and just get it done in one topic at a time. I think that's the best way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, I got two applause. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm going to repeat basically what I said in the very beginning of this series. Uh, 
uh, the same point I still think is valid and that uh, the the reason people become Mormons primarily is because they're born into a Mormon family. Um, I, I did a research before I started the video and I don't remember the number now but it's very very small there's only roughly 10 million maybe give or take a million or two roughly 10 million Mormons in the whole world so it, it's not it's here in, in Nevada where I live and you know next to Utah and then and in the United States we, we see a lot more Mormons than you do around the world uh, most people around the world don't even know what a Mormon is or have any idea even though they've been sending missionaries all over the world for a long time uh, so most of them are born into the, a Mormon family and then some people who become Mormons because missionaries talk to them and, and get them into it and the main attraction what draws them into it I think part of it Tanya I, uh, I hadn't thought about that before but I think your point may be really really uh, uh, big part of it too is that the desire to be part of some special group that knows something that others don't get yet you know your feeling of superiority that you're the ones that got it right but but I've always felt the biggest reason is just simply because of the desirable families that you see that they have they have old-fashioned family values they have large families uh, they uh, and obviously they have the same kind of problems as other families too but they keep it really really secret and the facade that the world sees is this wonderful church that has beautiful families and uh, that's what I want and they say oh man I wish I, I want to be in a family like that that would be good for my family there's a famous person on TV uh, uh, Glenn Beck and uh, he he had one of the biggest viewerships on all of television on Fox News for several years and he became a Mormon and he in his testimony he said that's the reason he became a Mormon. He wanted something good for his family. He checked at all the churches, and it was the best family values of any of the churches. And his story is, I think, very, very widespread. That's one of the big reasons. So a lot of people in Mormonism don't get into it because of theology, and they're not, and then or they're born into it, and the theology is not what come. There is just they have to be born into that family. Now, how do you how do you witness them and get them out of it? Well, it's very very difficult because, uh, as we discussed, showing them the scriptures, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have as, that good of success with them because their attitude is that the Bible is is uh, wrong and the Book of Mormon is what's right. They have the Book of Mormon, they have Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants and then their last is the Bible. These are the four books. They can actually buy a book that has all four of them in one cover. Okay, those are the four. But they say that the Bible is the least uh, of them all because it depends so much on how you interpret it and the others is what you trust. You trust the Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants. So trying to show them in the Bible is um, they're going to argue that uh, the, the Bible can't be dependent upon its a uh, matter of how you would, so long as it's rightly interpreted. Well, you know, we know that, that is true because we know. <laughs> I don't. I haven't always interpreted 100% right. I've had to learn over the years. I know that a lot of people we know we disagree with how they interpret it too. So it's true, but that's their fallback position that we can't really depend on the Bible because you know everybody's interpreting it wrong. So what do you do? Uh, I believe the best way, and this may not work either, just because. It's theology is not the issue it's the family and they don't want to leave their families and all the business connections and all the the, the, the relationships that they have um, that's a very attractive thing and they don't want to give it up especially in Mormonism there's only one group of people who go to hell forever Ever, a lot of people go to hell temporarily as we discussed in the previous study uh, you know you and I if we weren't Mormons we'd go to hell after a while we paid for our sins and we get to go to some lower form of a level of heaven you know but but they say the only people who go to hell forever and ever and ever and ever is someone who's a Mormon and leaves it so that's that's the intimidation the, the fear that they put on them uh, so how do you convince them that Mormonism is wrong uh, on my playlist Mormonism debunked I have a couple of videos I'm in the middle of something. I'm sorry to say. One called uh, uh, Book of Mormon uh, versus the Bible. 
right. and, and it shows you uh, that the Bible can be proven to be historically correct, archaeologically correct, and uh, prophetically correct, and so on. And then points out this same does the same test on the Book of Mormon, and it fails over and over. Historically, it's proven wrong. Archaeologically, it's all wrong. Uh, even even uh, uh, what's that where you do your genealogy? Even the names and genealogies are all wrong. So it can easily be proven that the Book of Mormon is just a fabricated book of fiction that's wrong. Now, if the Book of Mormon falls, then logically uh, Joseph Smith and the rest of the religion should fall because it's founded upon the premise that he's the prophet that's going to give him the true book. Uh, so, but to, for someone to use that, they have to uh, value the truth more than they value their family. And that's the problem we have with Mormonism. Okay? So uh, I'm going to give everybody a chance. Our two hours is up. I'm going to give everybody a chance to make just a, you know, a very brief closing remark and say your goodbyes. And then we'll start a new topic uh, that, on talking about Jehovah Witnesses uh, on our next study. Uh, who, oh, you look like you're real anxious to speak, Eric. Go ahead. Oh, no, I just noted that um, uh, Tanya was bringing up that someone has a question in the comments for us, apparently. There's a, oh, okay. there's a question Tanya. there. Do you want to read the question? Or sure. The question is, uh, and it's by, let me make sure I get the name right, Kim55200. And the question is, uh, is there a way to find out what you all believe about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, but that has nothing to do with our study today. I, I don't want to go off on that tangent. Uh, let's save that question, and we can discuss that uh, some other time. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for your question, but got to make the questions relevant to the topic. Uh, okay, uh, Eric, uh, or, or let's start with Brother Austin. Go ahead and make your final remarks. Uh, thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, I was just uh, going over this earlier today, and I'm just going to put this out there uh, just to back up the simplicity of the gospel of salvation. And uh, keep in mind, just pay attention to this, uh, not direct to the panel, but uh, just anybody that reads this. Pay attention to how this is worded, and uh, just look at all the words that supposedly everybody keeps trying to prove you need to have this in there. But, uh, you know, the funny thing is it's not. You know, just the one thing is there, and uh, everything else comes after. So. I'm just going to read it real fast. It's Acts 16, 30 through 31. And they said, and they brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You know, that's simply that and that only. Uh, there's not other things tight in there. There's no hidden messages. There's no catch to it. Once it's said and done, it's said and done. Uh, Jesus said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth upon me, hath everlasting life. There was no secret catch or do a special thing or believe this before you believe this or clean up your life and all this. Uh, we need to understand that the gospel is a, it's a saving gospel. It's a simple gospel and it's a, uh, it's a, it's out of love and it's out of grace. So uh, thank you, Brother Luke. It's been fun and uh, I'm glad we could get this exposure done. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother Austin. Okay, Brother Eric. Um, something I'd like to mention, just as kind of off topic, or not well, one topic, but just hasn't been mentioned yet, is I realize that just to those who might be watching, uh, we realize based on the title of this on YouTube, on, uh, on Google+, Plus, that obviously Mormons are going to come across this, they're going to watch this video, and they're going to see what we have to say. You know, Please understand, above all, all things, we love you. And that our purpose here is to, you know, is to to have these discussions to hopefully uh, bring to light some things that you, you may not have considered about the scripture. Um, we realize that this is something that nobody goes into Mormonism uh, half-hearted. If you go into Mormonism, it's something that you're really full-fledged into, and and it's a really big part of your life. And so, you know, please understand that the you know, the message here is we understand that we understand you're not going to agree with what we have to say. But out of love for you and the message we believe that uh, Christ wants us to deliver, um, that's the reason for the message. You know, that's the reason for trying to clarify some of these issues. And uh, you know, if Mormons have questions, or, or uh, I'm sure any of us would be more than happy to answer our viewpoints on things. Um, so you know, feel free. Don't feel like this is just a bashing session or anything like that. I don't feel like anybody's done that here. It's really just been a discussion. So, uh, so I just wanted that to be something that's that's out there. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned that. We, we, we should always make sure that we, we tell Mormons and everyone, whether they uh, agree with us theologically or not, that uh, uh, you know, we do love them. We want, just want them to come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and because we care about them. And literal, I literally have some of my best friends who are Mormons that I, uh, that I love dearly. So it, it's not it's not personal. It's just that we want you to understand the truth about God and salvation. Okay, uh, Brother Jackson. I would like to start by saying, if anybody is watching this and you let's and, and you're a member of the Mormon Church and you're having your doubts, maybe you've been very committed and passionate up until now, but you're having doubts now. I would just really encourage you not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. You know, if you're starting to have doubts about the Mormon church, about the, what Mormons are teaching, and maybe you're consider, considering leaving seriously, you know, what happens a lot, unfortunately, is someone will leave the Mormon church, and then they want nothing to do with God ever after that. So I would really encourage you to look at the biblical Jesus, to look at the real church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, not the one that's nominally called that, but the real church that Christ set up in which he offers eternal life as a free gift by faith alone in Christ alone, as Brother Austin read in Acts 16.30 and 16.31. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brother Jackson. And Sister Tonya. I uh, just want to say thanks for having me, and sorry I couldn't participate more. I had some stuff going on around the house, but um, it was a good discussion. And to the Mormons watching, I would just say that I love you, and um, it's okay that you're wrong. And down to, in all seriousness, is are you going to believe what the Bible says, or are you going to believe these other books that, you know, aren't? the Bible. And, you know, all of our faith stems from uh, the Word of God, and, you know, that's what our hope is in. So, you know, I just think it's, you know, a wise choice to put your faith in what the Bible says and not what you know, the other books say. And I guess that's my only advice. Hey, thank you. Um, well, you know, we have kind of a uh, uh, kind of haphazardly told people about Jesus and salvation, even in this two-hour session. But we we haven't done it in a in a real proper way yet. So I'd like to end every one of our broadcasts with some kind of an invitation or altar call or something. So uh, I want to ask uh, maybe uh, Brother Eric uh, if you want to just give an invitation to people, tell them tell them what they need to know so they can be saved. You know. Um Brother Jackson touched on this a little bit today. He mentioned several times that God is, or, or, or Brother Austin, one of them said that God is simple, but he's righteous. He's simple, but he's just. God does not do things to make things complicated for us. He loves us. He deeply loves us, which is why he did what he did uh, through coming to die for us. Um, this is something that, that he wanted to make simple. Um, I think you should question when something feels like it's not simple. Um, God's done that for that very reason, that he opens a door that we don't really deserve. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we can earn. It's not something that we could ever be good enough to achieve uh, to reach God's level of perfection and greatness. And when you see that in Christ and what he's done for us, you know, just simply believe on what he has done, that his blood was sufficient, that his blood covers all the sins you have committed, past, present, future, and that's simply believing in him alone for that and simply trusting in him, and that's it. No extra work, nothing else. The work comes later. Trusting in him is the key, it is the door, and that is what all you need to come forward and have that relationship with God, the, the relationship that you really desire to have, that personal, close, one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're going to end the show. Uh, I'd like to just say that if anybody's watching and uh, you you heard this uh, message uh, from Brother Eric and you choose to put your faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ, if you do that, 
please make a comment let us know because we, we would love to celebrate about that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to end the show. I, on, if you're on the panel, we can talk uh, privately after the show. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.